The Scream Kings are in no way responsible for any encounters with the paranormal, extraterrestrial abductions, eldritch insanity, hauntings, curses, hexes, demonic possessions, cryptozoological sightings, or any loss of sleep that results from listening to this podcast. <laughs> This is the Scream Kings podcast. I'm Nathaniel Darkish. And this is Max George. They're in your podcast and they are watching you. Dun dun dun. We should have said that in Spanish, really. Well, do it. <laughs> I can't translate on the spot. Hello, everybody. Uh, están en tu casa y te están observando. Randole. Uh, okay, let's, let's, let's move on. <laughs> Man, and I'm not even the one who speaks Spanish out of us. All right, cachate la boca. <laughs> All right, um, and we are not the only people in the virtual recording space. We have a guest that you have uh, heard before. You have loved what he had to say. We have Andrew Scahill. <laughs> the law, the first ever Scream Night, I believe. Yes. Yay. We don't have anything special for the third time, Andy. So. No, it's, it's all right. Uh, for this year, bad things are happening tonight, so um, I'm happy to not have that. Do you mind just giving a, a brief reintroduction for those who might be newer listeners, or just kind of uh, who you are, why, what you love about horror, and and you know your your bona fides? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so Andrew Scahill, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Colorado Denver. Uh, in the English department, I specialize in film, uh, specifically the horror film. Um, I write a lot about uh, evil children in horror films. Um, but I, I guess um, what kind of compels me uh, about this film just to start is that there's just really interesting horror happening right now in South America. And I think it's a really fascinating time to kind of examine their output. Yeah, so the, the movie that we are going to be talking about today is uh, Aterrados, a.k.a. Terrified, uh, if you prefer the title translated in English, but I like to just go with Aterrados. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's, it's interesting, too. I, I do speak Spanish, um, although I can't translate on the spot, Nathaniel, but Aterrados uh, really means the, like, the terrified. It's much more a noun than it is a verb, from my mm. understanding of the language. Um, and I think that subtle difference, even in the translation from English to Spanish, means a lot because I think the meat of this movie came out in 2017 is about the people who are experiencing what is going on more so than the actual events that are occurring. And we'll dissect that a little bit on because I feel like that got a little problematic towards the end. Uh, but yeah, just kind of an interesting Spanish fun fact. Okay, um, so just a, a few basic facts about the movie, then we'll just kind of give you a, a brief plot summary, and then just kind of dive into what we like, what we don't like, what our thoughts are on this movie, and then you know, really kind of get into the, the meat of what, what it is and, and why we we're drawn to talk about it. Um, so, a, as reference, it was uh, released in 2017. It was written and directed by uh, Demian Rugna. It is an Argentinian horror film, which I believe is the uh, only South American horror film that we've covered on the podcast so far, which we need to uh, continue to remedy. Um, yeah, absolutely. Because, yeah, this, this film is uh, really well, well produced, well done, and it's definitely you know, gained a lot of traction, I think, in the horror community. I know that there has been talk about an American version of it being made in the coming years, I think that's kind of been on hold for a while, but you know, probably COVID is part of that. And I think Guillermo del Toro is attached to that in some capacity. Yeah, I'm I'm excited. And I also believe that there's going to be a sequel film that uh, was recently referenced by the uh, writer director. So, and what I really enjoyed about this movie, in terms of plot, is it at its core, it's very simple, right? We see kind of these supernatural experiences happening to a family which then we kind of zoom out and we realize that they're happening 
to a few houses in the area. Um, and really, that's that's it. There's not much more to it other than there's this this barrio, this neighborhood that is getting haunted in some regard, and and everyone is trying to to figure it out as they go. We as viewers know that the, the neighborhood is being haunted, but these characters, these individuals, don't quite fully understand it until you know the latter part. It's interesting too um, that but, like the different ha- there are different hauntings, right? It's not like a consistent, yes. um, and and that's one of the kind of really fascinating um, sort of features of this is that it, it's um, it's so kind of vignette driven. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's dig into to what these three different hauntings are. Um, so so the first one that we see is uh, Clara and Juan. They are a uh, married couple they're um basically just you know kind of live in life doing their own thing it referenced that maybe one of them hit a dog uh with a car recently but other than that everything's been pretty normal in their lives and then they start to hear weird noises almost like you know construction or something happening like from like the apartment next to theirs and then uh one day one uh, in the middle of the night, hears some noise coming from the bathroom. He goes in, and uh, Clara is has been picked up by this invisible force, and is just getting smashed against the walls of the of the bathroom, and and has just you know been totally brutalized and is definitely real dead. And then he gets you know kind of taken away to I, was it a mental institution or a prison? I I'm not exactly. Sure, maybe I was not paying as close attention as I ought to have. I got the vibes it was a a mental institution. I didn't feel like he was imprisoned at all. And and I want to say, too, this this scene when he encounters his girlfriend just being sort of flung around the shower, A, it's really horrifying. Um, Oh, yeah. And and this scene just gripped me from the beginning. But then there's something else where... I think it like sets the template for later like iterations is that it's pretty strongly quoting an another horror film uh, an American horror film. I think the sequence is meant to feel very Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely see that where it definitely feels yeah, very much like Tina's death in the first one when she's getting dragged around the walls and just is is, you know, yeah, getting beat to death and torn apart. Yeah, no, I that that's a great observation. I I I like it had you know, some some sort of memory fire in my brain, but I didn't quite connect it. So yeah, that that was what I was looking for. Thank you. It was bothering me. It's it's really fascinating too because I think the second haunting that we can discuss also harkens back to a very similar, not similar, but very American horror movie, and that is, I would say, the Paranormal series. You have this neighbor who keeps kind of hearing things go bump in the night. He is the the neighbor to the the main character the protagonist we have at that time the protagonist kind of changes throughout the movie which is fun yeah yeah so the neighbor of Juan and Cl- and Clara anyway so he starts to kind of videotape at night to see what's going on and you start to see things kind of move very poltergeist like behavior and then we just see this very gangly lurpy probably what I look like naked walking around <laughs> in his house that kind of is under, under the... Ugh, it's gross. And he's like 10 feet tall, which is a really disturbing thing to me. And he, he, he lives under the bed, and then he's in the wardrobe. Like, it's, it's this very... Lives in the dark places of the home, right? And, and we, we get all of this information, not through the character's eyes, but through his home video recorder. We see the creature emerge from the bed on that not in actual life, except at the big reveal when it comes to the closet. Yeah, and, and I think that's a, a great uh, connection as well that you made, because, yeah, one, we have, you know, a, a home video camera that, that catches this paranormal event happening um, that's providing evidence, and also, um, similar to paranormal activity, you know, we have uh, a moment where we have this, you know, tall, freaky, naked guy stand just next to his bed as he sleeps, which feels a lot like a lot of the, the things that happened with Katie and in the Paranormal Activity first film. Absolutely. Uh, and I find this to be something almost like primal from our childhoods, like those spaces in our home or in a room, which is supposed to be safe, that we can't see under the bed, in the closet, right? I think there's a reason why those are so archetypically frightening for children. And 
And to expound on that even more, Andy, I think goes even further. There's a scene where this character looks out towards his window and you see just this terrifying shadow kind of creep out from where he's looking. And and who of us has not been terrified as a child? You know, you're sleeping, a light passes through your window, and, and you see something in a room that is just so unsettling, and it's just a shadow. Uh, or there's that, that silly meme that goes around where, you know, when the lights are on, it's a pile of clothes, but when the lights are off, it's a demon from the Nine Hells. Um, it's, it's just this really intense moment with this character of these primal fears that it is such a great juxtaposition, I think, of what we just saw with this, this poor woman being thrown around. You know, we have all of this body horror, this gore. And then the movie takes it even further. We completely diverge into a whole new route. And Andy, do you want to talk about the kid? Um, yeah, so, uh, so we have a, another neighbor um, who has a child, and um, I would argue in a sequence which very much feels um, referential to Pet Cemetery. Um, the kid uh, is, is hit by a bus in a very shocking way. Um, and we kind of find out that his corpse is kind of arriving um, in uh, Alicia's house. Yeah, I mean, so, so for me, you know, this is this is probably my favorite of the three vignettes that's that that we see coming up because one, how they have designed this corpse of this boy is just so upsetting. Um, like, like it's not that he is just like falling apart, but rather it's just that he is dead and cold and unmoving and stiff. He's definitely dead. And and they also keep doing this effect where there's like this you know like flies flying around his head and eating him. But but you know kind of what they're doing with him is you know okay so yeah one he has arrived back into the the family home and is sitting at the dinner table uh, and he's just sitting there and but but you see these nasty footprints leading into the house you know all the way from the cemetery. But also you know it, it mentions very early on because when we kind of first encounter this we we see this more through the uh lens of one of uh, alicia's friends uh who was uh is a cop and and he comes and he quickly learns that yeah like other people who are are there checking us out they have seen him move or you know everyone's swearing that they, they've seen him move there's even you know a, a scene pretty early on with with the section where there's a little boy who runs up to the house to, I don't know, see, I guess, if his friend can play, not knowing that his friend is dead. And he just, you know, looks in, and then there's just, you know, like, uh, the, the suggestion of, of some movement, and then he just runs away screaming. And, and it's just so eerie, because it's so simple. Yeah. And I think it's really kind of what made me really start to appreciate this film, is that this is so different than the other hauntings, right? It's not based on shock. Um, it's not based on gore. It's about this sort of like uncanniness, you know, this thing that looks like my son, but is it my son? Um, and I think not knowing if this spirit is malevolent, because the previous two instances, uh, instances have let us believe like this is a malevolent kind of spirit demon. And here, it, it, I don't know what it is, right? It seems melancholy. Well, and it, it's also interesting, too, that it, it contrasts the first two hauntings so differently. The, the first two are so supernatural. Yes, they're rooted in, in primal fears, but it is this, you know, naked 10-foot man versus this poor woman being thrown around the bathroom. Uh, this third haunting, it could happen in real life. Uh, the sorrow and the grief can compel us to do some wild stuff. And I think that is kind of the horror here, is this poor mom was just in so much grief that this boy, I, I don't know, it was just so unsettling. I love the scene where the detective and his partner are just kind of there, and the cinematography really just lets it breathe. We can see those flies. It's so simple and soft and quiet, and you just want to get to the next scene because you're so uncomfortable. You know, and, and I write about ch children in horror films, and there's this sort of trope of the forlorn child, is what I call it, um, in, in horror, and it's usually a mystery um, plot where the child has been murdered in the past, right? So I think like Stir of Echoes, um, The Orphanage, that kind of movie. Um, and, it, and The Changeling is like the classic one. And um, part of it is that 
the parent, often they've lost a child, has to discover the trauma of the past in order to free the spirit, right, of this child. But that is so much where the person is haunted by this figure, but no one else can see it, right? This is so material. Everyone can see this child, right? And it seems so different than other representations I've seen of the ghostly child. I, I definitely agree. And and one thing I really like about this haunting, actually there's, there's two things I want to bring up here, is that one, this, you know, this event, you know, it's it's kind of guessed uh, among the, the police and, and everyone who's kind of investigating this that it's entirely possible that he didn't, you know, dig himself out of his grave and walk himself over there. That he's there because his mother couldn't leave his body. That That, you know, this is almost her creating this haunting herself because she just wishes so bad that he wasn't dead that she literally puts him in the living or, you know, or at the dining room table. Right. Yeah, and there's been this spat of films in the last, uh, I don't know, five years or so where they're using the horror genre to talk about grief, right? Mm-hmm. Like Midsummer using um, the horror genre as, as a metaphor. Yeah, yes, um, you know, grief feels like a haunting, right? But this is something different. Uh, and yes. I think it's a nice kind of inversion of that as well. Yeah, it's it's Pet cemetery. if instead of Gage getting reburied and coming back as a zombie... <laughs> <laughs> they just set his body in the living room. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the film, too, has shades of um, Devil's Backbone, which I'm not surprised that Del Toro um, liked this film quite a bit. Because it feels like his kind of vision of um, the deceased child. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And, and, and you know, a, a film that also that Del Toro produced, uh, The Orphanage, you know, also has a lot of that same kind of vibe to it. Uh, another thing that I wanted to point out that I think is significant is that, you know, we, we've kind of mentioned that all of these are, are neighbors with, with these kind of hauntings, for the lack of a better term for them, but they're all connected to each other in, in some way. Because, you know, like we mentioned, um, Walter, who's getting haunted by the big tall man, is, is the next door neighbor to, to Clara and Juan, and the things that he's trying to do, or the things that he's hearing, is also what's going on in, in their uh, you know, in, in their apartment. And so, like, those those sounds are connected to each other. And then when we see this uh, young boy die, it's during Walter's section where there's a, a thing where he's just kind of, like, looking out the, the window and he's staring at this boy, and this boy is staring back at him, and that's when he gets hit by this uh, bus or truck or whatever it was. And so it's it's almost like because they're just so broken... Or, or affected by each thing that's going on with them individually, it, it spills over to the next person, and to the next person, and to the next person, and, and you know, and then and then it starts to spill over to the people who begin to investigate it. So it's almost like the the presence of a bad thing happening makes more bad things happen, like inherently. Well, it has it has a cancerous quality to it, right? Um, which is so interesting, and, and I feel like this is um, part of other national cinemas kind of responding to the mode of, of Japanese horror, you know, which is, is different, right? It's, it's not like um, I'm being haunted by the ghost of Billy the Kid embodied here in my living room. It's in Japanese horror, like a place has become sick, right? And it's become corrupted. Um, and there's a kind of wound on a place. And I, and I feel like this feels in the vein of J-horror. Yeah, yeah, very grudge-like in a lot of ways. Yeah, and it, we just, uh, our last episode we did Poltergeist, which we, we all know, you know, is about this neighborhood that is kind of settled on top of a, a graveyard. And the contrast between that American-made film and this is really fascinating because Poltergeist is about one family, that nuclear, cis-heteronormative family. This, they kind of throw that out of the window, and it, it's about your neighbors. It's about the area. Um, and, and that really resonates with me, what you just said there, Andy, is that for me, you know, I love the occult, I love the, the supernatural, but really what I come to believe is their places have energy associated with them. And, and isn't that more realistic to some regard, that if a, a murder happens in a home, that is an event that might scar the home, and, and that is a more interesting haunting to me than, you know, the murderer dies 15 years down the road, and now we have to deal with his ghost again. So. Yeah, and, and, and we don't know what shape the scar is going to be. 
or or what comes out of it you know lore and mythology has this beautiful idea of the tulpa where belief in something and society's belief in something even a family's belief in something if it becomes so powerful that idea or the belief becomes real and that's beautiful and terrifying at the same time uh and I really think that is presented in this movie very well. Yeah, you know, and I think too that in a kind of like pandemic era, this feels like a pandemic film. You know, it's like this, mm-hmm. this that if my neighbor is sick, it can spread to me, or you know, be it be it kind of literal, or uh, my, my my neighbor's uh, I don't know hatred, discrimination of other people, like how it can infect a place. I think it's really prescient. So I think at the end of the day, what this movie does better than a lot of other horror that I've seen recently is it it maintains the simplicity of the scares. Uh, a dead child's corpse. That is scary enough. We don't need it to, you know, have black eyes and cloven hooves to be scary. Um, a, te- a ten foot naked man hiding under the bed who's watching you while you sleep. That That's scary. That's That's all we need. Um, a, a loved one getting thrown around and the blood and the gore and the, the body horror of that, that it, it, these, these horror moments being attacked by something you can't see. I mean, I think there's something yeah. just, just terrifying about that idea. It, it just lets those moments of terror breathe. Uh, for me, the shadow on the wall, it takes a lot for me to get scared, as you both know. I mean, I think we're so desensitized to the horror moments that is in cinema, but that shadow on the wall, that simple moment, it really kind of freaked me out. Um, and I don't know, the, the first part of this movie really was impressive for me. It really made me think, wow, why is this movie not more well-known? This is great. These scares are very unsettling. How about you two? What, what were your thoughts? I agree, and I think one of the things we talked about before is how it uses um, both suspense techniques and shock. You know, whenever I teach a horror um, cinema class, I always start with kind of, we put everything under this like horror banner, but there's a lots of different affects in <clears throat> horror, right? Like disgust is different than paranoia, that's different than shock, that's different than dread, right? Like, these are all very different affective registers. And one of the things that I noticed this film does is that it alternates between sort of suspense techniques and kind of shock gore techniques um, in a way that, as a spectator, you can't anticipate where the threat is coming from. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, uh, I, and I think also what it, it does so well is it, it plays with kind of all of the different types of horror in ways that aren't necessarily what you expect. You know, we, we've made comparisons to, yeah, other films with all of these, but it's like a twist on all of those. It's not just, hey, it did this one thing really well. It did this one thing well, and also it was deeply upsetting in a new, unique, fresh way. It also had a good effect, you know, it had great effects that, that looked very um, effective, you know, I, I don't know exactly what the budget of this film was, but you know, I, I don't usually see many films coming out of South America, and then uh, you know, I know that budget tends to be a big reason for that. And so, you know, the the work that they did to make this film look like it does, feel like it does, really, I, I think, comes together very nicely. Yeah, and this is part of my kind of greater appreciation of this film, I guess, because the first thing time I watched it, I you know I, I noted the references. I was like, okay, this is the Nine Brown Elm Street sequence. This is the Pet Cemetery sequence. This is the Poltergeist sequence, um, or the um, the Conjuring sequence, right? And so I guess I finished the film and I thought, well, what is this movie? Is it just like a series of references? of homages and i think that i I feel like the film's more skilled than that than just being um a a sort of play of references i think there's something deeper going on in this film about non-us cinema sort of being haunted by the dominance of, of colonial dominance of american genre cinema right how do you live up to hollywood cinema in fact yeah you are in many ways haunted by it and i think I think that's a very 
insightful point of view here with this movie. Oftentimes I, I hear myself telling friends and family that foreign horror is so much better than American horror just because I don't know if it's different or if they can go a little bit further or what. But I, I think this movie in some regard is fighting back, you know, saying, look at all these tropes. We can be, we can use your American tropes, the poltergeist moments, the pet cemetery moments, you know, whatever we want to call them. And we can be just as scary and kind of give us the middle finger in the most respectful and well thought out way that really kind of takes your breath away and, and scares you. It scares you. Yeah, it isn't a sort of a snide commentary because I think the director loves these movies that he's referencing, right? And I just, I, I'm just compelled at how this film, like house to house, feels like um, almost like a haunted house that you walk through, right? Like here is, um, you know, the this segment, and here's this segment. It feels like almost almost like an on the rails kind of experience. I, I like that comparison a lot, um, and because yeah, it, how it's shot. How the, the you know creatures come at the cameras and and how kind of we get to interact with the horror as an audience feels very um, personal and and you know it kind of feels like it's kind of breaking that that barrier of the screen a lot of times because because it is so relatable right like the the fear of of suddenly losing a child or your your loved one or the the terror of just the dark or the weird things that that happen you know the weird sounds in the night you know all of those are are so much uh things that that we can act with yeah and you know i i I think too of like um some of the some of the urban paranoia that um that polanski really tapped into this like idea um of that you're living next to people that you don't know who they are right um and that there's one wall separating you from these complete strangers who are next to you at all times and and um and, and Plansky was really good at exploring that with something like Rosemary's Baby um I get that in this film as well so let's kind of push along here and maybe talk about some of the aspects of the movie that didn't work out so great well I mean yeah yeah we, we definitely need to, to kind of yeah dig into these uh other major characters because yeah we're, we're really scratching the surface of the first half of the film really um, you know, so yeah, let's talk about our paranormal investigators. Yeah, uh, the, there comes a point in the movie where the focus kind of shifts on those being haunted onto the detectives of this boy, um, and he eventually meets a paranormal investigator who just happens to be in the area, kind of form this ragtag team, a paranormal troop that go to these individual houses late at night to really try and document what's happening. And these individuals are talking to Juan at the beginning of the movie, and so this is the moment where the circle kind of is completed, that we understand where Juan is, who these people are, what they're doing. Uh, I loved, I loved, loved, loved the, uh, the little gringo, um, Rosen talk. Uh, I speak Spanish, and so hearing his just gringo Spanish in response, it was like, oh, this takes me back. He is my people. But this this moment where the, the focus has shifted from the hauntings to the paranormal group is where, for me, you know, the horror of this movie was so developed, so thought out, so good. And then this plot starts to diverge, and I feel like it's it, it becomes taking a circle peg and putting it into a square hole. It, it fits, and it makes sense, but you kind of have to push to get it there. I mean, I agree. I don't think it's a film that knows how it wants to resolve. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I guess that is something that I was just kind of willing to go with for this film. The one character that does bridge the kind of two halves uh, is, uh, is it Juan? Yeah. Um, Juan kind of joins the paranormal act, um, investigators as they investigate these homes. Is it Juan or is it Funes? Oh, it's Funes. Sure. Sorry, my bad. Because he's kind of a skeptic, um, but in true South American heritage, he is very like superstitious. Um, he does not want to get close to this corpse of the body. He's there uh, with Walter, who is kind of the lead detective. He seems very skeptical, but at the same time, he believes in it 100% and does not want anything to do with it. He was great. I really enjoyed his character of them all. Uh, Nathaniel, what do you think about kind of the paranormal group and when they entered the movie? Give us your thoughts. I think at first it it 
was fine. Um, I, I felt like that provided some new opportunities for scares. That's when we get actually a lot of the scares with the dead boy, is when they kind of start to, to poke around and start to really understand things. But then, yeah, I, I, I agree that the, the film didn't really know how to resolve itself in a meaningful way. Because it is, you know, three different types of things, it, it really just didn't ever quite click for me. Um, and, and for me, I would say the biggest problem I had was just a moment of, of dialogue where they're in uh, Walter's house <clears throat> and they can, like, see the, the scary naked guy underneath this, like, side table or something. And and he looks right next to one of them, and he looks right next to the other. Yeah, it looks like he's right next to the other one. And then, uh, I don't remember which character it is, but he's like, see, it's like light and uh, perspective and all of these things. It, it all makes perfect sense. And I go, wait, what? And then suddenly they get, you know, are getting killed and attacked and all sorts of stuff. And so, like, it felt like that tried to be the explanation, and it wasn't anything. <laughs> and And so... Yeah, and then, you know, we just go to kind of stereotypical, uh, the the cop goes and he covers everything in gasoline and everything gets really intense and he lights stuff on fire and we get some jump scares and I just felt like, yeah, the plot kind of fell apart because they didn't really know how to tie it up because I don't think it should be tied up necessarily. Yeah, f- I, I agree, Nathaniel. For me, there was there was so much unknown about what was going on. The unknown of the the three hauntings, what really was happening, how this started, and so them trying to like force an explanation that it was the water, it was light, it was dark, it was perspective, light can't exist without shadow, and shadow cannot exist without light. It, I don't know, it just... It was very disappointing. Up to that point, I was so impressed with the flow of the movie, and I just feel like we hit dam and it didn't know what to do it didn't know how to get through the dam and so it just just did whatever it wanted all right so here's a little rant about why i like haunted house why i like studying haunted house movies uh because haunted house movies are always about colonialism right Uh, that's why they're such a popular american genre is because they're about um new residents pioneers who come into a home it has previous inhabitants who are more savage, and we have to evict them, right? Uh, And we do it through the power of Christian might, and the Christian might purifies the land, and it's about the dominance of sort of rational thinking over the savage, right? So it's just about, like, America's decimation um, of the native populations. Andy, I have to stop you right there, because you just solved everything that I hate about possession movies. That it is this Christian Catholic crusader and they are the only ones who can save the day because they know demons and no other religion can. It was one of my biggest issues with Conjuring 3, if I'm honest. Oh yeah, that's that was definitely the I one. also hate those movies, but I mean, I like discussing them and why and breaking them down. But here's this film in which none of that happens. Right, and and it's and, it, and you're kind of saying that it feels unsatisfied, right, that result. But I think that this is a film that says that that's not the answer. That's not going to fix anything. We don't know why this happens, um, right? Uh, and we don't know how to fix it. It just feels like a very contemporary um, film in that mode for South America. You know, I I would have to disagree with you there a little bit, um, just because. I feel like they were trying to resolve it. While they weren't using that Christian crusader type of method, they had this... Yeah, they had this character who conveniently just knew that perspective and light and dark and shadow was the way to kind of understand what was going on here. But Uh, but it doesn't solve it. (laughs) No, it, it doesn't. No. But she just had this convenient information that helped kind of the plot move forward. Um, and so had they left it as, we don't know what the hell is happening here. What do we do? No one should live here anymore. Yeah, like, give us some... So you don't think that 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 speech is supposed to feel insufficient? I I felt the most, like, again, I'm I'm referencing our last episode where we talked about Poltergeist. 
uh, where we have this character come into the, the plot who just seems to know all of the answers to some regard and is able to explain it away and provide exposition into the plot so we as watchers can feel like there's a resolution or some sort of I don't know. I, I I love possession movies. I love haunted house movies and I don't need a, a Christian crusade or Christian win to feel good about the movie. I just I, I feel like this movie, like you said earlier, didn't know how to end. And it kind of was, you know, flopping like a fish for me at, towards the end. But I think this is part of this film's relationship to American horror cinema, is that it is going to give you that moment from Poltergeist almost word for word, right? Mm-hmm. And it doesn't work. <laughs> it's not sufficient to explain anything. Yeah, it's not sufficient to explain anything, and then the alternative seems to be, I don't know, I guess we just light shit on fire now? That doesn't work, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, because now, now it's kind of like followed them to. Uh, I don't know it feels like the um, it feels like the unresolved nature of it follows, mm-hmm. right? This says this is a modern era. We don't believe in the power of revelation to to make things um, all right again, like the way we might have believed that in the eighties. Because in a kind of Trumpian era. Like, the truth is right there, but people just don't care. You know what I mean? And so we've lost faith in the power of exposure, in the power of revelation. And I feel like this film, like it follows, like speaks to that. And I I get what you're saying there. I just think it follows does it a little bit better. It leaves us wondering, what really happened here? Is Is it some sort of succubi, incubi, or... You know, it leaves us with this question of what's going on, but terrified, it it gives us an explanation that these creatures somehow live in the light and the darkness, and it's all about perspective. So it kind of gives us the present without us not knowing what it is, you know. Yeah, yeah. I I read that moment as deeply, like, insufficient. Uh, (laughs) I mean, and this is, this is, um, who says that line? Is it, uh, uh... Oh, it was Rosentag. Yeah. It was Rosentag. Oh yeah, it was Rosentag. All dead, right at the end of this. And I, I just think it's 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 the expert character, but without any answers. Well, and I wonder too. This just kind of hit me in the brain. Of this character is definitely an American. Is he kind of flexing that American? perspective on what was going on sure i, I mean and, and, and he he is genre literate right this is like a this is like postmodern horror cinema right you have the character in the text who's literate about the conventions of horror yeah but his his rules of american horror cinema don't work here well fuck now i have to change everything i thought about this movie <laughs> <laughs> i think it is being more postmodern than 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 we we've been discussing like i think it is using these cinematic references to talk about a certain relationship to American cinema. I think that that is a, a fantastic point, though it is ultimately unsatisfying as the way to resolve a, a horror story. Sure. Oh, I hate the chair being flung at the audience, right? It, it feels like oh, uh, yeah, a, that a was bad awful. 3D movie. So, yeah, no, absolutely. I don't think this film knows how to resolve, but I also think it's smarter with its kind of intertextuality than at first it seems. So let me ask the question to you both. If you had a group of people that, you know, they're looking for a horror movie, why would you recommend this movie to them? What would be your, your motivations in recommending uh, I can start. I'm a pretty, um, what's the word, uh, where, where things don't work for me anymore, like scares don't work for me anymore. This one genuinely terrified me. Apropos to the title, they're... Even with its like references to other films, it was like um, it was like it captured what was so horrifying about me watching Nightmare on Elm Street the first time. Like that's what that opening scene does to me, and it's it's not remaking the scene, but it's almost capturing like the terror I had the first time I saw that scene from from Nightmare on Elm Street. So I think the way that it uses visuals in this film is is really astute. And I think for me, what I would recommend is kind of crosses that bridge of being something that really scares even the most profound horror fanatic. 
but at the same time it has language and it has a resolution that connects people who might not be as advanced when it comes to horror movies. It it delivers to both sides of the coin. And overall I was very impressed. There are things of course that I don't like, but Andy you made me completely question. <laughs> but you know, I, I, there there's rarely a film where I don't have problems, especially with like plot conveniences. I mean, a pretty tantamount to horror. I, I will say because this film feels so much to me like a haunted house, I don't mind the in between shuffling between rooms because I feel like the individual vignettes are so strong. Daniel, how about you? What would you say? Um, I I definitely agree that like, especially the first half to two-thirds of the movie it's it's very strong on the scares it's well created like the the cinematography is excellent the the you know special effects are excellent it's it it is very scary i'll say it it may be a film that works better for you know fans of horror already um you know kind of based on on our discussion here but you know all of that says said like yeah, I, I think it is a, a really strong example of, you know, us not having to stick with just the same old, same old American horror cinema to have a, an effective horror film. You know, I, I feel like so often, you know, people are so hesitant to watch um, foreign films in general, uh, which, yeah, you know, they're, they're missing out on a lot. Um, and, and, you know, I I think that seems especially true with a lot of horror, where they just go, you know, oh, but it just feels so boring because I have to read everything, and and it just kick, takes me out. And I go, you know, th- this would be a film where I would just say this is a, a pinnacle example of, you know, it lets these these moments and these scenes really like let you stew in how how awful and and weird they are without necessarily having to just have a constant onslaught of dialogue to read. And and really, I dislike when people say, you know, I have to read, it's in subtitles, so I'm not going to watch this movie. I understand the mindset of not being in the mood for that, but if if you're a fan of cinema and you don't watch movies because they're foreign or they are in a different language, you're missing out on 80% of what the world has to offer in terms of cinema. I feel really bad uh, for a, a coworker of mine who, like, there's a lot of movies that I want to rec- recommend to him that are foreign films but are but unfortunately he has uh dyslexia and so you know it, reading subtitles is you know he he will miss 90% of the movie if he's trying to read the subtitles but you know barring you know a, a reading disability i think you know yeah. you're you're really de- depriving yourself of a, of a lot of great uh content in general uh not not just this you know not just atarados but you know there there are some real great gems across the genre and you know of course outside of it. Absolutely. All right. Well, should we kind of go into our ratings, screams and crowns? Uh, Andy, as a reminder, we always rate our movies uh, on a scale of one to ten. Ten being the best, one of course being the worst. Um, and first up is Scream. So, how scared were you watching this film on a scale of one to ten? I'm, I'm gonna say that I was legitimately scared um, watching this film. I'm gonna put it at a, a, a nine because you know oh, there wow. are just moments in this that I've seen that scene a million times. Like how many times have I seen um, a monster in a closet scene, right? And it found ways to make it fresh to me. Max, how about you? Where where would you put it on on screams? I'm really kind of behooved that you gave it a nine, Andy. You're kind of the horror king. Uh, and so for this movie to give you a nine, that's that's pretty intense. Yeah, and some of it's what I said before is that it, it alternated between shock and dread in ways that really kind of had me off guard. Um, I gave it a six, uh, and the only reason I say that is the first two thirds really were terrifying for me. But then once the paranormal group kind of started their shenanigans, it, it really pulled away from the horror element. If they could maintain what we saw in the first two thirds, I would have given this a nine easy. It would have been on par with movies like Hereditary and uh, the Evil Dead remake for me. For me, I gave it a 7 on Screams. I, I definitely feel like, you know, again, yeah, the, the first two-thirds were really strong with, with, the, with the terror. That last third had a few really good moments, like when, when they are like walking in 
to the the mom's house and you see her dead body hanging behind them. But then unfortunately, you know, it it kind of got undone a little bit by then suddenly like the the dead boy is standing behind this door and slams it shut and stuff like that. That was a little bit too cheesy for me. But let's move on to crowns. Uh so I'll kick us off on this one. Um so as far as kind of overall quality of the film, uh, I would give it a 7 uh for crowns. I I feel like it's a really strong movie. It, you know, again just has some problems at the end. I originally gave it a six, but after talking through it with Andy and you, Nathaniel, and really kind of reflecting on it as we go, I would bump it up to a 7.5. This is a superb, very stellar movie. Very well done. Uh, more people need to know about this. What about you, Andy? Um, you know, I, I do think it has story problems, um, but I, I would give it a seven uh, as far as it, its ability to tell a story. There's definitely things I wish were tightened up, but like I said before, I think it's a film that's kind of vignette driven and i don't mind that the interstitial stuff is a little underwritten so now uh what i uh, what we're gonna do is just move on to how we are staying spooky you know what what we have been consuming lately that is you know horror or horror adjacent that uh you know keeps keeps us on our on our toes max you want to kick us off on that yeah sure i actually have kind of a real life story that really terrified me quite a bit the other day. Uh, but before I get into that, um, I watched a movie a few weeks ago, and I, I have mixed feelings about the movie itself. Uh, it's called Wrong Turn. The new one? Uh, it's, yeah, the new one. Uh, okay. It's about a group of tourists that are in the Appalachian Mountains. They go on a hike. I told not to go on the hike. And of course, uh, horror ensues, and they become captured by this tribal group of people and i won't spoil any more of it than that uh, it's got some really awesome body horror some really intense moments where you're kind of grimacing and quite scared uh, at the end of the day though the plot kind of makes it crap the bed as nathaniel you like to say <laughs> uh it, it just didn't deliver but it was fun it was just one of those moments where you you watch it and then you're just like ah that was great but i wish it was a little bit better so Wrong turn, the new one, pretty fun. My real life horror story is I suffer from insomnia a few days ago. I was tossing and turning, I couldn't fall asleep. I did my meditations, I was had music on, you know, whatever. And I woke up around five o'clock in the morning and I heard something coming out of my kitchen. I'm like, oh my god, what is going on? So I get up out of bed and I notice that my computer in my bedroom, the, the monitor was on. The computer had turned on. It's kind of weird, and so I, I left my room to see what was going on, and every screen in my house, my TV, my iPads, my laptop, my you know, Microsoft Surface thing, my work computer even, all of these devices had turned on. And the voices I had was hearing was coming from one of my iPads. I was watching a, a D&D YouTube video, and it was playing on this iPad, and it scared the pants off of me. I'm sure it was just a power surge or whatever, but I have friends who say Pazuzu is finally making his voice known once again. But it, it was scary, especially after uh, our recording with Rachel the other day, Nathaniel. It kind of got to me. Yeah, whenever, whenever there's any technical glitches, I just assume it's Pazuzu. We've, we've made him mad too many times. <laughs> well, it, you know, it, it's appropriate that uh, the tagline, uh, they are in your podcast and they are watching you. I feel like uh, it is us uh, manifesting that, as you said. I, I had a friend tell me that I need to move immediately, and I said, no way, the rent is too good. If they're living here, they're benefiting from this low rent, so they can deal with it. If anything, they can maybe get it lower. Yeah, no kidding. You know, classic excuse, though, to stay in a haunted house. That rent's so good. I did have a fly bother me the next day. It just, I couldn't kill it for the life of me, so it's either... Beelzebub or Pazuzu, one of those insect demons that just needs to go on a date or get laid or something. Leave me alone. <laughs> or just lay, you know, fly eggs in your eyes. Ooh. All right. Well, so I have been staying spooky uh, lately. Uh, I read, or recently, I read a horror novella uh, called Ring Shout by P. Jelly Clark. I, I'm not exactly sure how to uh, pronounce uh, their their middle name. Uh, it, 
Yeah, so it's D-J-E-L-I. This is, I would describe it as Lovecraft Country meets Buffy the Vampire Slayer um, in 200 pages. It's really fun. It's uh, basically this uh, team of people who, who hunt what they call uh, Kluxes, or sorry, Ku Kluxes. Uh, they are, which basically it's, you know, this is uh, set in like the 1920s. This is, you know, kind of the uh, resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan in America. You know, the birth of the nation has just, you know, gotten a whole bunch of people into it. And this, I, the idea here is, is that with this huge resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan, some sort of demonic force is feeding on their hatred, and some of them are becoming these demonic monsters, the Ku Kluxes. Wait, this isn't this isn't like a real article. This isn't real life already. I mean, I mean this this has some 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 you know more kind of supernatural you know demon slaying sword kind of stuff going on. But <laughs> but other than that, it, it 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 feels very prescient in a lot of ways. I'll say that. <laughs> um, but it's it's a really fun story. I really dug it. Um, the only problem I have with it is that it's only 200 pages, and I want it to be the next 10 season you know TV show that I'm obsessed with because it slapped real hard. It, it kind of yeah checks a lot of boxes. You know, for for those of the, you that like you know love Craft Country, either the the book or the uh, TV series, or if you're kind of a, a you know want want sort of a Buffy esque story, but you know with a more uh, socially conscious uh, bent. Well, um, uh, so just thinking about um, Latin American cinema, specific Spanish language horror cinema, um, I thought point out just a few um, Spanish language horror films that are really fantastic that people should check out. Um, yes. One of them uh, is from Mexico called The Similars, and it is a bonkers take on a kind of um, Twilight Zone. Uh, uh, Outer Limits style, and, and so it's done in the style of a Twilight Zone um, set in modern-day Mexico. There's another one called Tigers Are Not Afraid, which I don't think got enough press, and it's kind of a Pan's Labyrinth uh, type film uh, out of Mexico in which children are in the run from a Mexican drug cartel and have a kind of supernatural world that they can call upon to protect them. Um, there's one out of Brazil uh, called The Night Shifter, and it is kind of a take on Sixth Sense, except it's a coroner who can speak to the dead. But he kind of betrays, uh, I guess you could say, like the code of the dead, where he shares the dead man's secrets, and now he's become cursed and the dead are coming after him. And then finally, a film called Baccarat, also out of Brazil, which is probably my favorite film uh, of last year. It's kind of a, um, a mix of revenge horror and kind of weird western um, where a town in uh, a town of Brazil uh, rich Americans and Europeans can pay to have the town erased from the map and then kind of go in and, and slaughter them for sport but this town fights back yeah you recommended that one to me last year I haven't gotten to it but I really adore it um, and, you, awesome. and I would love to come back and talk about any of these uh, films with you guys because um, I, I think I think, honestly, some of the most interesting stuff right now is happening in South America in terms of uh, genre cinema and, and talking about using horror for progressive purposes, right? When so long it's been kind of the mouthpiece of the status quo, now it's really interesting to see people use the mode of horror to talk about being a minority in majority culture or things like that that horror can really kind of bring language to. Yeah, I, I think yeah, we'll definitely have to have you back on. I'm 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 personally leaning towards like the ti or tigers are not afraid because then that would be blending that plus also you know children in horror, which is you know your your uh, bread and butter. So. It is. It is. In fact, I um I do a movie night in my backyard, and Tigers Are Not Afraid is the one that we uh, just did this week. So it's it's a film I'm happy to champion. Nice. Yeah, I've heard nothing but good about that one, so it's it's been high on my list for a, a hot. Yeah, likewise, likewise. Okay. Well, I think that pretty much wraps up what we had to, to cover. Uh, where can people find you online? Yeah, absolutely. So I have a Twitter handle. Uh, it's my name, Andrew Scahill, S-C-A-H-I-L-L, -L, and a website, um, A-D, um, S-C-A-H-I-L-L, A-D Scahill. All right, excellent. Well, uh, since we don't have anything else to say, 
Stay spooky. Stay spooky. Stay spooky. Need even more Scream Kings? Here's our obligatory shameless social media plug. Follow us on Twitter or Instagram at Scream Kings Pod. You could also email us at ScreamKingsPodcast at gmail.com. Help us reach a wider audience of horror fans by leaving a review on iTunes or by sharing a link on social media. You can also support the show by going to patreon.com forward slash Scream Kings. Stay spooky.